Be here now. Just be here now. It's impossible to reach the heights of real fulfillment, or what in the yoga tradition we call self-realization, that does not also contribute profoundly to the good of all beings. Welcome to the Metta Hour with Sharon Salzberg, where Buddhist wisdom meets everyday life. This podcast is brought to you by the Be Here Now Network and features interviews with the top leaders, teachers, and thinkers of the mindfulness movement and beyond. For more information, visit BeHereNowNetwork.com backslash Sharon. Hi, I'm Sharon Salzberg. I'm joined today by my friend and colleague, Stephen Cope. Stephen is a best-selling author and scholar specializing in the relationship between the Eastern contemplative traditions and Western depth psychology. For nearly 30 years, he's been a scholar in residence at the renowned Kripalu Center in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. He is also the founder and former director of the Kripalu Institute for Extraordinary Living. A prolific author, Stephen's seminal works are Yoga and the Quest for the True Self, The Wisdom of Yoga, and The Great Work of Your Life. His most recent book, The Dharma of Difficult Times, Finding Your Calling in Times of Loss, Change, Struggle, and Doubt, was released in January of 2022 from Hay House. Welcome to the Meta Hour, Stephen. Oh, Sharon, it's a total delight to be with you. I wish we were in person, but in these particular days, that doesn't happen. So um, I'm just imagining we're sitting in our beautiful Kripalu Main Chapel, where we usually sit to have these convos. Yeah, it's true. We've talked together for many years, Yeah, which is so great. Where are you right now? Where are you recording from? I am sitting in my office in Albany. Mm -hmm. So I I live and work from Albany, which is about 50 minutes from Kripalu. And it's a lovely, gives me a little urbanity in my life. And um, it's an easy schlep over to Kripalu. So uh, I'm happily, happily situated here. It's great. And a big congratulations on your new book. I mean, something that has been so delightful through the years as we get together to teach is like, are you writing something? Are you writing something? Where are you with it right now? And this is so hard. Oh, my God. I love, you know, like just reading the title and subtitle, The Dharma of Difficult Times, Finding Your Calling in Times of Loss, Change, Struggle, and Doubt. So then I wondered, well, I thought that subtitle could be a lot longer, too, you know? (laughs) Yeah, believe me, it Unease, was. Unease, pandemic, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> despair, oh like, my fear. God. Like, it was longer. I had to edit that down. As, was it uh, longer? <laughs> uh, I couldn't figure out which partic- of the particular adjectives I wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> Did you write it during the pandemic? Well, actually, I started it before the pandemic. Uh-huh. And, um about a year into the pandemic, I was almost done. And it became clear that, oh, my God, the pandemic has changed the world in mm-hmm. so many ways. The um, Not just the pandemic, but the way in which it unmasked all the, you know, the, the, the passion around social justice. And mm-hmm. it unmasked who we, who we are and some of our history in this country. And so... I, I actually had to s- not exactly start over, but as you know well, occasionally whole chapters go on the cutting room floor. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, four or five chapters that I loved had to go mm-hmm. so that I could really let it be a book that spoke to current times. Mm-hmm. And I'm so glad I did. I'm so glad I did. My my wonderful agent, whom you know, Ned Levitt, mm-hmm. uh, goosed me to do it the way I've done it. And and I'm very grateful to him. That's great. Um, There's so many uh, kind of terrible phrases associated with writing, like kill your darlings. I never liked that one, you know, like the the passage, the line, even the chapter you are most attached to. Yeah. is probably the one that's going to get edited out. So like deal. Exactly. You know, Annie Dillard in her great book on writing entitled The Writing Life says, 
very often the the very chapter for which you wrote the entire book in the first place ends up getting cut Mm -hmm. and um that kind of happened to me in this one and as, as she says you write from left to right at least in english you do and very often toward the left hand side a, a lot of it doesn't end up in the final thing mm-hmm. so yeah <laughs> although my my great editor at bantam tony burbank always just yeah. said, nothing is ever lost right yeah. it comes back it comes back so i i have sitting here a bunch of chapters that i kind of love and thinking eh those will come those will come in handy. Yeah, some. someday. <laughs> I'm sure you have chapters everywhere. Sharon. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. well, for for so listeners fun. who aren't so familiar with your journey, could you give us a little background on how you came to be you? What sure. brought you to no, the spiritual I, path yeah. to Kripalu? You know, I I not to overburden the history, but I, I grew up in the Midwest in a very Protestant family. And, and kind of religious and spiritual in the best way. So I, I grew up with the privilege and advantage of having, of being surrounded in a community. My father was a, a president and vice president of a college, a, a, a Presbyterian college in Ohio. And um, I was surrounded by wonderful, very real spirituality in, in the world of academe. And um, so I I was temperamentally really prone to be interested in that throughout my life. And then when I when I got into graduate school, I encountered the great Chigun Krumpa Rinpoche, Mm -hmm. who's who had a center in Boston where I was in graduate school. And I started sitting with them and it was my first exposure to the Dharma. And I was blown away. I don't. I, I think you must have had this experience because I know some of your history. But my first contact with the Dharma through Rinpoche's writings and through our their very rigorous sitting practice, which I took to pretty much like a duck to water, um, I was so on fire with the Dharma when I was in graduate school. And that began a a sitting practice, and also eventually, inevitably, I bumped into yoga. Um, so that when uh, when I had a crisis in my life when I was 40, I decided to take a year off, do a sabbatical. I decided to go to Kripalu Center, which was a great place for me to, um, to do a year-long sabbatical, really focusing on reading and studying and, and practice, both yoga and, um, and meditation. And um, slowly over the years, I became kind of a fixture and a pillar at Kripalu, and it's been 32 years now, and and I'm still there. So that's a brief story. (laughs) Well, thank you for inviting me to Kripalu, and and of course, I remember the conferences you set up so well, you know, for some real conversation between these different schools and different um, traditions, actually. We had that whole series of conferences back in the day called East Meets East, where we invited great uh, Buddhist teachers and yoga teachers to talk about the relationship between those two great traditions. And that went on for four or five years. Mm -hmm. You can't remember a number of those, as did Musang and Joseph and others. Um, And, um, yeah, we had some wonderful, deep conversations. So speaking of deep conversations, let's go back to the book for a minute, okay. which sounds like, I mean, there couldn't be a better title for 2022. I know. Which is and, like year and, three, you know, of yeah. really and, difficult circumstance. And, and that's just current times, you know, like uh, many people, you know, went into this with a lot going on and, you know, a few resources and things like that. So I want to read um, this opening quotation by Aldous Huxley. Sure. We say, uh, sometimes crisis alone, without any preparatory training, is sufficient to make a man forget to be his customary self and become, for the time being, something quite different. Thus, the most unlikely people will, under the influence of disaster, 
temporarily turn into heroes, martyrs, selfless laborers for the good of their fellows. Very often, too, the proximity of death produces similar results. Yeah. This is a, a quote from Aldous Huxley's great book, The Perennial Philosophy, which I, I urge readers at some point to read. It's an astonishing compendium of, of wisdom. Um, and I went on in, in the book that we're talking about now to profile eight different lives, what we might call great lives, or in retrospect, great lives, each of whom encountered some disaster, some trauma, something I call in, in the book, the disorienting dilemma. And it was really as a result of coming to terms with that dilemma that each of them made a huge contribution to the world and, and also found themselves what we would call in the yoga tradition, self-realizing. That is, not only discovering a profound sense of personal fulfillment in their work in the world, but making a huge difference in, in the common good, uh, which is why I love that quote from Aldous Huxley. Mm -hmm. um, people under difficult circumstances, as we're facing right now, so often just step up mm -hmm. um, to, to a duty they didn't even know they had. And so I've been fascinated in, in my last series, few books, I've, I've read a ton of biography because I, I get interested in what exemplars, great exemplars are doing. And um, in this book, I focused on, on those who encountered disorienting dilemmas and, and had to essentially rethink their view of the world and, and of reality. And this, this is so, that, that phrase, disorienting dilemma, comes from trans, the transformational learning people. And, and the idea is that that kind of dilemma forces you to look deeper into the way things are, which, of course, is precisely what happens at the beginning stages of, of Buddhist practice. Um, you might, in, in a way, call these, as, as we talk about in Buddhism, the four holy messengers. These are, this is a different kind of messenger. I, I think the four holy messengers are um, illness, death, old age, and the holy person. Am I right there, Sharon? Yes, the yeah. mendicants, yeah. The mendicants. Yeah. And, and in this case, the holy messenger is a difficulty that forces people to look more deeply at what's true about how the world works. So, again, in Buddhism, you might say that it's, it's an opening to look at the profound nature of impermanence and no self and suffering and dukkha. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, it's, it's interesting because I, I wrote the title for this book and had the idea before COVID. I was, I had been, involved in a in a very difficult situation with one of the many institutions I'm involved with mm -hmm. um, in which I felt treated unfairly very mm -hmm. unfairly mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and I had to I was wrestling with unfairness oh unfairness happens to us all it's it's part of the way the world works mm -hmm. and so I got interested in um, in the disorienting dilemma before COVID, and then, as if a, as a gift to my publisher, the we really entered into difficult times, mm -hmm. all of us. So mm -hmm. um, it became quite pertinent. And, and of course, your publisher—I mean, they're also wonderful beings. They weren't saying, "Oh, good." <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> the world, the world <laughs> is like uh, we're not saying that. No, <laughs> uh, nor are they now, um, but. What happened was, and, and um, you know, I really, once COVID hit and, and so forth, I really did have to do a serious rethinking of how I wanted this book to, um, to be organized. And I'm, I'm mm -hmm. so glad I did. I, I brought in people like Marian Anderson and Sojourner Truth. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and as you know, having read the book, I, 
I organized the whole book around one particular disorienting dilemma that we in the United States of America have faced since our founding, which is the fact that our, our central documents of, of our founding talk about the, the, the view that all men, all human beings, mm-hmm. all persons are created equal. And yet we were founded with slavery as a part mm-hmm. of, uh, as a part of the deal. And that was a dilemma from the beginning that mm-hmm. we've had to struggle with. So I organized the book around eight great lives who were influenced by the view of the Bhagavad Gita and the way in which they came to grips with their particular experience of either enslavement or Jim Crow or racism. So that I I start the book in 1830s Concord, Massachusetts with Henry David Thoreau, and then I take it all the way through um, Gandhi and Martin Luther King and Harriet Beecher Stowe and Marian Anderson, Sojourner Truth, all the way through until the present time with Ruby Sales, Mm -hmm. uh, who's a wonderful activist down in, in Alabama. Um, but looking at the different ways in which each of these individuals had been affected by uh, enslavement, racism, xenophobia, because this the scripture called the Bhagavad Gita, the great yoga scripture, um, has been the most important scripture worldwide, mm-hmm. I think, throughout history, and it's 2,000 years old in confronting the problem of of xenophobia and fear of the other and um, fear of the outsider and therefore racism and everything that has so like finally come to the fore in a in a, in a way in our culture that um, that some real change is happening that's really fantastic you know one of the things about the legend of the Buddha as Bodhisattva being aspiring to enlightenment before his enlightenment, uh, when he left the palace at the age of 29 after mm-hmm. a lifetime of you know tremendous self indulgence, mm-hmm. um, and he saw the four heavenly messengers the sick person, the older person, the corpse, and the mendicant. Mm-hmm. Uh, he asked his charioteer, who had like helped him with the escape out of the palace grounds, he said, yeah. Does that happen to everybody? Right. Is that going to happen right. to me? And and that's just like a little subtext to that, mm. you know, to realize, oh, we're not so different in some of the fundamental dilemmas of life that we face, exactly. but we feel so different because of circumstance. Right. Um, it's a it's a central view of the the yoga traditions. And it's very central to this scripture called the Bhagavad Gita or so- Song mm-hmm. of God that all human beings are, and I quote from the Greek Gita, are made of the same stuff. In other words, all human beings are, in every way that really matters fundamentally inside, um, in, 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 in mind and heart, made of the same stuff. And that's precisely the, the wording that the Gita uses. They talk about the vision of sameness. And it's it's that understanding of how uh, deeply we're connected and part of the same family that that yoga aspires to to live out in the world mm-hmm. so one of the one of the things about this book is I wanted to talk about um, I, I you know we live in a world all of us live in a world that's that's quite saturated unfortunately with with narcissism that is to say with a kind of clinging to I, me, and mine, and a and a, a preoccupation with self fulfillment, um, much of which is is actually fine, but the the Gita is a scripture that basically says there is no authentic personal fulfillment that does not also contribute to the common good, mm-hmm. and this is something I think we're awakening to right now in our culture that I really wanted to highlight. So each of these lives that I that I talk about uh, and write about in the book uh, is is exemplary of the way in which um, personal fulfillment and the common good go hand in hand. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
And I, I love that notion because um, it's, it's easy to think only about personal fulfillment as about me, my great life, my wonderful writing, my brilliant career. Um, but the fact is that it's, it, it's impossible to reach the heights of real fulfillment or what in the yoga tradition we call self-realization mm-hmm. um, that does not also contribute profoundly to the good of all beings. And um, that's, that's pretty much the underlying premise of the book. Mm-hmm. It's beautiful. I mean, yeah. it's, it's so hard to um, describe what is really a kind of exquisite balance because sometimes people, of course, as you know, get into some kind of spiritual practice and uh, they think it's really ultimately about self-denial. So it's more kind of mm-hmm. martyrdom, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and exactly. and you know it's very subtle to say it's good to care about yourself. It's good to uh, cherish your potential. Yes, to break That's through, cool. and uh, it's just oddly enough, one ingredient, one big ingredient of that is going to be thinking about others. You know, it's true. And um, you know, my first book about the Gita was entitled "The Great Work of Your Life," mm-hmm. and I I focused there on the four pillars of dharma and let me just describe for the listeners that dharma as as most of us know is a very complex sanskrit word that very often when we hear it in buddhist teachings means path or truth or law Mm -hmm. teaching in the bhagavad gita that i'm writing about the word dharma always means sacred vocation or true calling. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, it comes from the root DHR, which means to hold together. So um, the the scripture is all about how to find and identify your true calling, your sacred vocation in mm-hmm. the world. And that, that book talks about the four pillars of Dharma that are laid out in the Gita. The first one is is discernment, which is you you discern what your most authentic calling is in this lifetime in this moment then you the second pillar is you do it full out you bring everything you've got to your your calling that that's called the doctrine of unified action and it's exemplified in all the characters i i write about the way in which they they leave they bring everything they put everything on the table right Mm -hmm. so find your dharma do it full out the third pillar is let go of the outcome let go of the fruits. This is called relinquishment of the fruits. Um, And the idea is that as, as Krishna in the, in the parable of the Gita says to Arjuna, it's better to fail at your own Dharma. It's better to fail at your own sacred vocation, having given it everything you've got than to succeed at someone else's. So the idea is that you let go of grasping to outcome, once you're really fully on to your calling, mm. um, because you don't really know what success means. You don't have a big enough tapestry of understanding yet mm-hmm. to even know what success or failure would be. So find your dharma, do it full out, let go of the outcome. And the fourth one is, in the Gita, the fourth one is turn, turn the whole project over to God. Mm-hmm. But I like this to reframe it to make it a little wider to say, turn the whole thing over to something bigger than yourself, mm-hmm. not just I, me, or mine, but uh, a bigger project. So, for example, if you, I, I always think of our beloved groundskeeper at Kripalu, who's dedicated his life, found his dharma. He's a nature, he's a naturalist, given full out, but turn it over to the well-being of this larger um, this this larger endeavor, which is Kripalu Center, which is doing so much good in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, so discern your dharma, do it full out, let go of the outcome, and turn it over to a higher power or a higher purpose. Um, and those are the first four pillars that uh, I've written about in my first book on dharma. Now in this one, I focused a little bit more in on the, this question of duty. And this is a harder one for people. So it's, it's easier, it's a little bit easier to talk about what lights you up, 
what Joseph Campbell called ta- talking about follow your bliss. Mm-hmm. This is important. It's important. It's a central component of Dharma. But this other, the idea of duty, it's harder to talk about. What is duty? What do we have a duty to? Mm. And w- what I've come to believe is that duty is that thing that if you do not do it in this lifetime, you will feel a profound sense of self-betrayal. Mm-hmm. So that is to say, duty is not what is called onto you from without, but what is called up from you from within. What's the mm-hmm. duty? What's the, that deep ardency you have for something in the world? Um, for example, uh, you mentioned that I've been at Kapala for 32 years. I have a profound sense of duty to this organization, which I've helped to develop. Mm -hmm. And it's brought me both a profound sense of personal fulfillment, but also there are aspects of it that are particularly difficult that Mm -hmm. I've had to do that are duty and that, that go along with the package. Right. So, um, so, uh, this is part of what I wanted to get into in, in the book. The, it's kind of the next, it's kind of a sequel to my first book on Dharma. Mm-hmm. Can you just give me a little historical reference for the Gita? Like, you know, so many of the um, Buddhist texts, they say were an oral tradition for yes, many right. years before they were written down. And, and sort yeah. of about when in the chronology did the Gita appear? Sure. So the Gita was, pro- we don't know for sure, but the Gita was probably written by a group of Brahmin priests sometime between the 2nd century BCE and the 1st or 2nd second century of the Common Era. Um, so this is a couple of hundred years after the Buddha lived, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If, if we say that he lived in, what, 473 or whatever into mm-hmm. the five into the 300s. Um, it was written, Sharon, it's such an interesting history because the early history of the yoga tradition is, is almost entirely a history of renunciation. Mm -hmm. That is to say, if you were going to be a spiritual person, you were going to renounce life in the world. Mm -hmm. You were going to don the saffron robe, throw, throw the final, you know, offering onto the fire and take to the road. This scripture was written in the 3rd or 2nd century BCE, just at a time when people were realizing everybody cannot be renunciates. Mm -hmm. And and what about those of us who are not renunciates? What about those of us who want to live a passionate life in the world? Mm -hmm. So this is a brilliant scripture about how you can transform a, a householder life, a passionate life in the world, into a spiritual life. Um, and I, I don't think it's been fully appreciated yet in 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 our Western culture how important the scripture is precisely for that reason, because most of us, even us teachers, we're not monks or nuns. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a certain amount of renunciation. Um, but how do you actually live a passionate life in a way that um, fulfills the soul and the spirit and the common good? And that's what this scripture is all about. Um, so it was a it was a breakthrough in the the flow of yogic scripture, which started back in the Vedic period in the but before 800 BCE, um, and the, you know all of the great uh, Vedantic uh, scriptures, the Upanishads, um, all the way up until the present day. But this scripture was groundbreaking for the reasons I've said. Mm-hmm. It's so interesting. Um, yeah. That, you know, there's such a, a spirit associated with it, with the Gita, that um, does have a lot to do with difficult times, with war, you know, with exactly. you know, yes. battle and, and so on. And um, it, But I also know you so much as such a profound practitioner and teacher of loving kindness. So yeah. let's talk about how that all fits in. <laughs> and, how does it fit together? Well, you know, and and also just these times, you know, it seems clear. Obviously, anyone who's uh, in touch with anybody knows that a lot of people are struggling, and and it can be really difficult. Even you know, this will 
uh, appear. This recording will appear, you know, quite a bit of time after we've yeah. laid it down. But I have full confidence that <laughs> there'll, be plenty you know, of- still, there'll be some struggle going on. Yeah. Well, I have to say, my friend, that I I was lit up by the practices of loving kindness by your very own self. Mm. Um, I was a frequent guest and retreatant at IMS for many years, starting when I was in graduate school. And Mm -hmm. I very often attended a, I believe it was a February month long that you and Joseph did regularly, or maybe it was a three week, it might've been a 22 day retreat. But early on in the life of your wonderful center, IMS, Insight Meditation Society, um, I remember that we did loving kindness practice toward the end of a, of the a, mm-hmm. a center retreat, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it was lovely. And and we did it. You know, we would end up with with meta with loving kindness practice to to all beings, and and become extremely expanded in in the heart center. Um, and then slowly over the years, and even over the decades, loving kindness as a practice has just come into its own fully. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I've been kind of along for that ride from the very beginning when it was almost a tack on at the yeah. end of a awesome yeah. session to today. And and my first deep introduction was a 22 day I did with you and pretty sure Joseph uh-huh. uh, Goldstein, and I'm not sure who else it was in May. I'll never forget it. I, I walked on the tennis court for 22 days those of you listening who know IMS will know what I mean, the yeah. old tennis court. And I sent Meta to my mother, who was the difficult person. Yeah, yeah. And I, I had been trained by my teacher at the time, I, I think it was you, to let's let's focus on this one for, for the month or 22 mm-hmm. days. And, I mean, it changed my life. It yeah. changed, it sweetened my heart so much toward my mother. And, and I always tell the story of, by the end of saying the meta phrases, the loving kindness phrases to mom, I thought she's got to be receiving these. Like if she's, <laughs> walking, if she's walking through the piggly wiggly right now, it's going to knock her over because it felt so powerful. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But it changed, it changed my life. And uh, I, m- I must say it changed her life too, even though I don't think she knows it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but it served me very well in these difficult times because, um, because honestly, Sharon, there's so much hate in the world right yeah. now. Yeah. And um, I've learned through my own practice of loving kindness that that hate is not required. Um, there's there, there's several profound misunderstandings that that folks have. The one of them is the idea that if you abhor someone's actions, that it's almost a requirement that you hate them. Mm-hmm. And that actually isn't true. Um, and not only that, but it's not useful. It doesn't actually help in changing the behavior. I learned a lot about that from Gandhi, by mm-hmm. the way, who might write about it at length in this book and who's on the cover of the book. Because when Gandhi decided to take on being the spiritual head of the uh independence movement, he basically decided he was going to create change without ill will, Mm -hmm. no ill will. And that was such a radical move. And, and he did it. (laughs) And it completely confounded the the British Raj. They couldn't understand that this guy was loving them even while he was opposing them. And um, so the this, this misunderstanding that that we have to actually hate the the evildoer or the wrongdoer. I think it would be better to say the wrongdoer is delusion. The other thing is I've learned a tremendous amount from you about anger, mm-hmm. um, which we see so much of today. Just, oh my God, on TV, just so much anger. And, and you have taken such a, correct me if I'm misstating you, such a, great even-handed and realistic approach to to this issue because we see as we see in gandhi's life for example gandhi was known to have an amazing temper oh really i didn't know that yeah no he had a huge temper and he actually used it quite effectively 
we see that anger itself has some strengths. It draws lines. It mm-hmm. sets boundaries. Mm-hmm. It brings us an enormous amount of energy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But but it also, as you've taught me so well, burns up the host. Yeah. Like the forest fire, anger becomes obsessive and it, it can burn you up. And this is what Gandhi learned, of course, which is why he decided not to unleash fury on the British Raj, but to, to actually unleash love on them. Mm-hmm. So um, those are two misunderstandings that our, our practice of loving kindness can actually can actually help. And the, the other thing that I take away from me from my now decades long practice with you and others is, and, and particularly in times of, that are really difficult, is to look at what we know to be the the proximate causes of the arising of goodwill. Mm-hmm. And this was this was one of the things I loved about Buddhism when I first discovered it. I discovering how interested the Buddha was in how things actually work. So what what are the proximate causes of the arising of goodwill in the heart? And the three that I depend on um, are first of all see the good in people, look for mm-hmm. the good. Mm-hmm which you can do without being deluded, which is important. You know, I, I grew up in a very deluded Protestant family that that did look for the good, and that was a good thing, but they also tended to be delusional about the difficulties. Right, sure. Right? So, so look for the good, number one. The second one is to identify with the suffering, like the view that we, we all suffer from greed, hatred, and delusion. We all suffer from the same things in very much the same way. Um, So rather than see it as other, understand how similar, even those people who are, especially those people who are acting in such a deluded way, are are suffering Mm -hmm. in in similar ways that we are. And then the third one is is the understanding that all beings essentially want to be happy. Mm -hmm. So look for the good identify with the suffering, realize that that we we know it ourselves. And that begins to break down a lot of walls, um, especially with oh, difficult political people so, mm-hmm. um, who who are suffering actually. Yeah. Um, and then all beings want to be happy. So I've relied on what I've learned from you and Joseph and, and others about meta practice through this whole pandemic and and wave of um, the unmasking of social injustice, shall we say, mm-hmm. in this culture. Well, I have two, and just to go back over a couple of things that you said, the reason that IMS, uh, the Insight Meditation Society, has had a tennis court was because we, we bought a uh, a novitiate, a Catholic novitiate. That was yes, and right. it's still uh, what we what we're using where we're dwelling right now, and and it um, had certain social amenities because these novices right. have come, you know, and still yeah. has a one lane bowling alley down in the basement. But uh-huh. we we filled in the swimming pool and and under the tennis court. So oh, no tennis court. Okay, yeah. Well, I mean, it's there as a. Yeah. You know, actually, uh, we had some ordinations there, so this is kind of sacred. Sweet. Yeah, <laughs> uh, part of it. Um, but people aren't. It's not like a spa, really. <laughs> yeah, no, no, come no. here. Right. Um, that impression. The yeah. other yeah. thing was uh, a meta phrase is the way that uh, loving kindness practice is done. Often, not only. I mean, there are many ways of doing it, but mm. one way of doing it, and the way that I tend to teach it is, um, we have certain phrases. Like may you be happy, may you be peaceful, that are shifting the way that we pay attention. So, say with ourselves, we might spend all day just thinking about our flaws and how terrible we are, and we're just gonna give a little airtime to wishing ourselves well and see what happens. Or the people yeah. we ignore, we disdain, we objectify, like the ones we now call essential workers. You know, uh, that play some role in our lives that we usually don't acknowledge, you know, check out person in the supermarket and so on. Um, you know, to actually pay attention to them through offering those phrases. But it may be like, since we're 
talking a lot about the difficult person, um, that that phrase is not going to work, you know, that there's some Mm -hmm. really deep investigation that has to happen, you know, Mm -hmm. like to wish somebody who's really causing harm in your experience um, to be happy may be a bridge too far, you know, because it would take a very deep dive into really what Stephen was talking about, the kind of internal dissonance and disconnection that causes us to cause suffering and all of that. So I've had students, for example, who find the phrase they can use in those situations is more Mm -hmm. like, may you be free of hatred. Yeah, that's nice. You know, going back to this uh, uh, Tibetan uh, kind of description, like, may you have happiness and the causes of happiness. Mm. You know, may you be free of suffering and the causes mm. of suffering. So mm. it needs to be, it's not a practice where you're just sort of like trying to force yourself to cover over, you know, difficult feelings. And Exactly. It's not a Hallmark card. And this is what I love about the way you teach. There's there's not a whiff of Hallmark in you, Sharon, which I <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'm not a whiff. I also love about this practice how how portable it is. Yeah. Not that all meditation isn't portable because it is, but you've talked about about using these phrases of well wishing, may you be happy, may you be at ease, even walking down the streets of Manhattan. Yeah, and. I took a cue from that, and I now there are certain places like the airport, for example. Yeah. When I'm stuck in an airport, as I was not long ago for 24 hours, I just take on saying the phrases for the guy walking by with the briefcase mm-hmm. and for the women, the woman with the babe in arms struggling with her everything she's schlepping under the plane, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. I've spent whole days just walking through the airport in Tampa where I was stuck, uh, sending Meta. And, you know, as, as our dear friend Sylvia Borstein always mm-hmm. says, it's sending Meta is not necessarily to change the other person. It sweetens your own heart. Mm-hmm. And so on those occasions, it sweetened my heart. And it can't have done the other person any harm, the guy with the briefcase. Great. Or mom, for that matter. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> or bomb for that matter. That's right. Um, so it's it's been such a um uh an addition to my practice. It 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 has over the over the years. That's great. And I love the way you bring what is really the spirit of loving kindness into all of your teaching and your teaching of yoga asana and um you know, because I'm, now I'm thinking about the Gita, or I'm thinking about those practices and how um, we can also have a very strong sense of idealism and then perfectionism, and then mm. our actual behavior is not really matching. Those, it's not perfect. You know, and so yeah. how are we? And, and, you know, I think about from the simplest things of a, a yoga exercise where maybe you can't get into that pretzel like pose that yeah, right, right. where you fall down or something like that. And, uh, you're so wonderful at sort of infusing it. It gives yoga a whole other meaning. Well, this is honestly what I've always loved about Kripalu yoga because it, it really is in many ways the, the, the yoga of compassion mm-hmm. um, and, and uh, the yoga of, um, of mindfulness, truly, because the practice of of Kripalu yoga, and there there are many different yoga lineages in in America and in the world, and they all have a certain flavor. Ours has this flavor of, it's all about learning to be present in the body right now, learning to be okay with how it is, even with difficulty in the body. This doesn't mean that we don't try to heal things and get better, but learning not to to go to war with the body even even to go to war to the extent of perfectionism mm-hmm. which is, is a, a kind of war of its own um, to which we're very acculturated in this in this culture so I do love the softness and the sweetness and the gentleness of 
of a good Kripalu yoga practice. And it's, it's basically what I do now. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm older now and mm -hmm. I, mostly I do and teach quite gentle yoga. And it's, it's astonishing how powerful it is just doing really simple stretching that's combined with mindfulness, combined with the practice of being at home in the body. Um, it's pretty much what I do now, and I, and I love it. It's great. I want to switch gears again back to the book for a sure. second. Can you tell us something about Harriet Beecher Stowe? Yeah, so Harriet Beecher Stowe, uh, as most of us know, was the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin. But I chose her because um, she had her own disorienting dilemma, her own difficulty that unleashed the power of her dharma. Uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe was, of course, the, the daughter of a great uh, Protestant preaching family from, from New England and, and a whole series of, of really profound abolitionists before the Civil War. Um, she moved to Cincinnati, which is on the Ohio River and is the dividing line between the slave states and the free states uh, in, in the 1840s when she moved there. Um, so she was quite exposed for the first time to the horrors of enslavement. Um, a lot of uh, self-liberated slaves crossed the Ohio River right at Cincinnati. She got to see a lot of that with the slave catchers on, on their trail. Um, but what happened to her was that she lost her two-year-old beloved son, Charlie, um, to cholera, which was then an epidemic, just like we're going through an epidemic in Cincinnati, where hundreds of people died every day of cholera. And she had to face the horror of parental grief, which so many women, and women including in my own family, have had to face. Um, and it's notorious for being the most ripping, tearing kind of grief. And in her grief, what happened to Harriet was that she began to identify with the suffering of the slave mother whose child had been ripped away, or the slave mother who'd had to carry her child out of bondage across the river. Um, and it was it, what arose in her was this profound experience of compassion, which, as you always talk about, is it, it is an understanding of our our deep sameness. Mm -hmm. This this notion that we um, we suffer in in the same ways, and so compassion arose for her in this hugely profound, energetic way. And she knew that she had to do some action in the world that would ameliorate or alleviate the suffering that she was feeling for herself and for others. And that was when she decided that she would fully, for the first time, take on her dharma, her sacred calling, which was to be a writer. And she would write a book about the horrors of enslavement, which she did. Mm -hmm. um, and she totally lit up. She became the writer that she could be and wrote a book that became the best-selling book of, of 19th century America, uh, the the only rival was the Bible, the actual Bible. Um, and this book itself was so powerful that it had the effect of changing minds about slavery and moving people toward abolitionism in the North uh, in a way that, that really made it inevitable that uh, there would have to be a reckoning and a struggle which we call the Civil War. Um, she went on, she's, she's given some certain amount of grief because some of the characters, particularly Tom in Uncle Tom's Cabin, is, is kind of a, an archetype of the long-suffering Christian. Mm -hmm. And um, it's important to, to understand that Harriet uh, went on to, that, that Harriet Beecher Stowe went on to write more and more actually revolutionary um, text. She, after she wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, she wrote something called uh, A Guide to Uncle Tom's Cabin, 
in which she laid out all of the research that she'd done on slavery and what it was like to be enslaved and the statistics. And um, uh, it, this was even more powerful a book, in fact, than Uncle Tom's Cabin itself. And then she went on to call to write a novel, another novel about a truly revolutionary black character named Dredd. Um, this was all before the Civil War. So um, here you have the archetype of the woman who not only found herself in her dharma and her own personal fulfillment in, in making this act of writing the book, but she also added profoundly in an equal way to the common good. Um, and so she was a perfect exemplar for um, for my book. The reason I asked was because when I was much younger, you know, maybe like high school, college, yeah, uh, people would ask me what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Literally, I would say, I want to write another Uncle Tom's Cabin. Wow. No kidding, Sharon. I, I want to write a book that will change people's consciousness. And that was just like my the way I expressed it. And so, um, of course, it was how many years before I actually wrote a book, like 20 yeah. some years, you know, but, and I haven't written Uncle Tom's Cabin, but um, that was my dream, you know, that, and it was encapsulated or embodied in her. I am so blown away because uh, I've never heard you say yeah. that before. Of course, we've never talked about it. Yeah, I and mean, people don't usually have this conversation about Harriet Beecher Stowe, but no. <laughs> since I know she's in your book. Well, that's fascinating information, Sharon. That That's, and, and it's so interesting how those premonitions, like why did you land on on her, how those premonitions have some reality to them. Yeah, and I you think, know, you know, of course, I didn't understand the complexities of no, you know the situation by any means, you know, right. uh, or the the pushback. But I, I just saw that a creation like that could change people's minds towards the good. It's, you know, and it so did. When Harriet Beecher Stowe met Abraham Lincoln at the White House, he said to her, "Are you the little lady that started this big war?" Because it was it was common knowledge that it was the it was the power of her writing that allowed people a glimpse into what it was really like to be enslaved mm -hmm. and the statistics and, and the facts, right? Mm -hmm. um, so um, it, it may be an apocryphal story, but it's, it's also true in, mm -hmm. in some sense. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things I appreciate so much about you is your ability to draw from multiple traditions, not just Eastern, you know, but Western as well yeah. and, and yeah. weave them together and, um, I'm just curious about that. Has that always been something that you've done or? It has been. Well, I, you know, I, as I said, I grew up in this very well informed and educated Protestant family in the Midwest. And so I was, I was exposed and I also lived with my family in Europe, in Spain, which was a, a profoundly Catholic country. But along the way, somehow I got exposed to the profound spirituality of the of the West. I got interested in um, the the great contemplative traditions of medieval Christianity and Catholicism. I was very influenced by, for example, the the Cloud of Unknowing by uh, Saint Teresa of Avila and Saint John of the Cross because I I did live in Spain as a kid, and so. I was very influenced by the Western tradition and, and also by the Western psychoanalytic tradition, which I studied in depth. And so when I, when I moved to Kripalu when I was 40, uh, I started making all these connections about the way uh, the, the congruencies between Western, the deepest kind of Western spirituality, the best of it, um, Eckhart and so forth from, the, from medieval mm -hmm. Christianity, um, and, and so I, I've always been interested in, in widening the scope and making those connections between Western and, and Eastern, much the way, say, Thomas Merton did when he finally, toward the end of his life, went to the East and um, in his memoir and diaries about that trip made all these brilliant connections between 
people like Jean-Pierre de Cassade, the great 17th century non-dualist Christian. And, um, and as I've, I've already said, the, the cloud of unknowing and so forth. So yeah, it's part of my, it's part of my passion, my mm-hmm. fascination. Mm-hmm. No, it's so great to be with you, uh, although virtually, and, <laughs> and to have this conversation. And just before we go, I was wondering if you could lead us in a guided practice of some kind. Oh, I'd be so happy to do that, Sharon, for you and for for all that are with us. So let's take a big deep breath in and let it out with a big audible sigh. <sighs> Take a moment now to find your posture for meditation so that you're sitting upright on those sits bones. The belly is relaxed and at ease. Let your shoulders relax now and let your whole face soften. One more time, take in a big, slow, deep breath and let it out again with an audible sigh. (sighs) Bring your awareness down to the whole area of the belly. So let the whole body be very much at ease and let your awareness focus on the area of the abdomen. Notice the subtle movements of the belly as they respond to the breath, the wave of breath. And let your awareness investigate all the inner sensations going on in the belly and the abdomen. Notice if there's any subtle sense of tightness or holding the breath in the belly. And let that really soften on the out-breath. So that with each exhale, you feel a little more relaxed, a little softer. If the mind wanders away from all those sensations in the belly, just notice, gently redirect back to the belly. See if you can let your awareness be kind of like an internal explorer. Exploring the whole internal landscape of the belly. As it rises and falls with the breath. Again, letting the body and the breath and the mind all be very much at ease without force or strain. Simply letting awareness come back again and again to those fascinating sensations of breath. The face is soft. The shoulders are relaxed. The mind is more and more absorbed in bare sensation.
absorbed in the rising and falling of the breath. Let your awareness move now from the belly up to the whole area of the chest, the lungs, the rib cage. Begin to let that same inner explorer explore this whole inner landscape. The subtle movement of the rib cage, the relaxed filling and emptying of the lungs. Body and mind quite at ease. Letting the breath arise and pass away without any effort to control the breath. Just breathing. Just sitting. Mind absorbed in the sensations of breath at the chest. Noticing sensations you've never felt before in this particular territory of the body. Perhaps you can feel even the subtle movement under the collarbones, the very top of the chest. The breath rises and falls. The mind becomes absorbed in the very details of sensation. Letting go a little more and more with each out breath. And now finally moving awareness from the lungs up to the very tip of the nostrils. Let awareness investigate the movement of breath in and out of the nostrils. Notice if the breath feels warm or cool. Is there more sensation in one nostril than the other. The rest of the body and mind are at ease. The body is breathing quite normally. the mind absorbed in the interesting details of sensation just at the tip of the nostrils.
when awareness wanders away, not a problem. Just notice and redirect back to the very tip of the nostrils. Just sitting, just breathing. Rising and falling. May you feel protected and safe, contented and pleased. May your physical body support you with strength. May your life unfold smoothly and with ease. And let's take in one more big, slow, deep breath. Let it out with a big sigh. (sighs) And slowly let the eyes flutter open. Taking in light, color, movement. I honor the light within you, Chai Bhagwan. Thank you so much for that beautiful meditation, and thank you again for joining me today. To learn more about Stephen's many offerings, you can visit his website, Stephen Cope, that's S-T-E-P-H-E-N-C-O-P-E dot com. And I recommend you get a copy of his new book, The Dharma in Difficult Times, which is now available in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook editions wherever books are sold. Thank you to everyone who's been listening. This has been the Meta Hour podcast from the Be Here Now Network. May you be safe, be happy, be healthy, and may you live with ease. Hey folks, thanks for listening. To learn more about Sharon and her ongoing teaching schedule, as well as online courses and a free guided meditation, check out her website at SharonSalzberg.com.